Mark chapter 16, as we finish out our study of the Gospel of Mark. If you'd like a copy of the notes for our study today, the ushers will come and bring those to you as well. Mark chapter 16, verses 1 through 8, as we, uh, as we come to, uh, to finish this study of the Gospel of Mark. What we're going to discover today is that the Gospel of Mark ends with controversy. And it's not only the controversy of the resurrection, it's the controversy having to do with the original ending of the Gospel of Mark. Now this is where it's important that you take your Bible and you look at your Bible, because most every translation will bracket verses 9 through 20 in your copy of the Gospel of Mark. They'll bracket it or they'll indicate in some way that the verses of 9 through 20 are not contained in some of the earliest copies of the Gospel of Mark. And so there is this controversy over the ending of the Gospel of Mark. Does the Gospel of Mark end with verse 8 or does it end with verse 20? So as we come to this, let's first read Mark chapter 16, verses 1 through 20, and then we'll think about this issue of what is the original ending. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid." Now, when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him as they mourned and wept. But when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they would not believe it. After these things, he appeared in another form to two of them as they were walking into the country. And they went back and told the rest, but they did not believe them. Afterward, he appeared to the eleven themselves as they were reclining at table, and he rebuked them for their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they had not believed those who saw him after he had risen. And he said to them, Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons." They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up serpents with their hands. And if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick, and they will recover. So then the Lord Jesus, after he had spoken to them, was taken up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the message by accompanying signs. So what about verses 9 through 20? Are those part of the original Gospel of Mark or not? I think the evidence indicates that verses 9 through 20 are not the original ending of the Gospel of Mark. In other words, the Gospel of Mark ends with verse 8. And here are the major facts that persuade me. Verses 9 through 20 are not included in the earliest copies of the Gospel of Mark that we have. Second, there are other endings that are also 
existent in other copies. So there are other endings other than the ones we have here in verses 9 through 20. Third, the vocabulary and writing style of these verses are very different from the rest of the book. And fourth, it's more likely that these verses were added than than that they were removed. And here's why. We would all agree that if the Gospel of Mark ends at verse 8, it ends very abruptly. It ends very abruptly. And that would have prompted a later scribe, copyist, to feel the need to fill in the story and give it a more complete ending. So for these reasons, I believe the Gospel of Mark, the original Gospel of Mark, written by John Mark's hand, inspired by the Holy Spirit, concludes with verse 8, and that verses 9 through 20 are a later addition. Now, having said that, when we read verses 9 through 20, though they're not the inspired word of God, written by John Mark, yet they are historically accurate. Verses 9 through 20 definitely reflect truths that come from the other gospels of Matthew, Luke, and John, and from the book of Acts. And so, though they're not inspired, they are historically accurate accurate. Now, opponents of Christianity in the Bible seize on this kind of an example to say that we can't trust the Bible that we have. Perhaps you've heard that. Perhaps you've had a friend or a member of your family make that kind of accusation about the Bible, that it's been changed over the years, and so we can't trust that we are really reading God's Word. We can't trust that we're reading the originals. But I want to suggest to you that the facts indicate just the opposite. With regard to the New Testament, we have thousands of copies of either the entire New Testament or portions of the New Testament, some of which are very close to the time of the original. We don't have any of the original writings, but we have thousands of copies that can be very and have been very meticulously compared and cataloged for their differences in order to establish the text that we have in our Bibles today. Now, Greg Kokel of Stand to Reason illustrates how this process works. Pretend your Aunt Sally has a dream in which she learns the recipe for an elixir that would continuously maintain her youth. When she wakes up, she scribbles the directions on a scrap of paper, then runs into the kitchen makes up her first glass, and in a few days, her appearance is transformed. She is just the picture of health. She is so excited that she sends handwritten instructions to the three ladies that are part of her bridge club. And they, in turn, make 10 copies and send 10 copies out to their 10 closest friends. All is going well until one day Aunt Sally's pet schnauzer eats her recipe and she panics and so she calls her three friends frantic to get uh, a copy of theirs so that she can write down her original recipe and lo and behold their pet schnauzers they all have schnauzers their pet schnauzers have eaten their recipes and so now so now the, the alarm goes out and they collect 26 of the copies that have gone out to their friends. And they gather around the kitchen table and they lay out these 20 copies of Aunt Sally's secret sauce. And immediately they notice some differences. First off, they note that 23 of these copies are identical. One copy has a misspelled word. Another copy transposes a phrase from uh, mix then chop, and in this copy it has chop then mix. And then in one other copy, it includes an ingredient that doesn't exist on any of the others. The point is, as they look at all these copies on Aunt Sally's kitchen table, can Aunt Sally, can she establish her original recipe with certainty? Can Can she do that? from the copies that she has to compare? Absolutely, no question. It's easy to see the misspelled word. That can be corrected. 
It's easy to see the transposed phrase. That can be corrected. And then the extra ingredient can be ignored altogether, and she has her original recipe. Well, similarly, this is the way our text is established through an academic uh, discipline called textual criticism that's not limited to just religious texts, but to all texts from antiquity. Scholars compare manuscripts, they compare copies in order to establish the original. Now, in terms of historical documents, there is no other historical document that has as many copies that can be studied and compared as the New Testament. There is no other historical document that has the amount of material in order to compare and to establish the original text. So that far from the conclusion being that we can't trust our scriptures, I believe this is actually an argument in the other direction that we can be very, very confident that we are, uh, we are reading the original manuscripts. We are reading what John Mark himself wrote. That being the case, John Mark indeed ended his gospel very abruptly. The question is, why? Let's read again verses 1 through 8. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. So again, why did Mark end his gospel so abruptly? You'll notice that he records no resurrection appearances of Christ. You'll notice that there's no other record of the disciples other than the reference made by the angel. What he focuses on is the three women coming to the tomb to anoint the body of Jesus but finding it empty. In fact, there's a bit of irony here because over the course of Jesus' ministry, and we saw it in John Mark, when Jesus told people not to tell others about who he was, what did they go out and do? They went out and told others about who he was. And here he tells these ladies to go tell the disciples he's alive. And what do they do? They clam up. There's a bit of irony here in his ending. So why did Mark end his gospel so abruptly? Why doesn't he tell us more about the resurrection? Why doesn't he give us more of the evidences for the resurrection? And I believe that that was not his purpose. I believe that purpose was accomplished in the other Gospels that give far more detail about the resurrection events. Mark was doing something else. And I believe the key is found in the words of the angel. Let's look again at what the angel said to the ladies. He said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth who is crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. By ending so abruptly, Mark was artistically pulling his original readers into the story. Now you remember his original readers were Romans in and around the city of Rome in the mid to late 50s. By ending here, Mark leaves open the question... 
What will the disciples do? What will the disciples do? Now surely, John Mark and his readers, they knew about the appearances of Jesus to the disciples and they knew that eventually the disciples believed and embraced the resurrected Christ. But here in the way that he ends his gospel, he leaves that question open. The question then becomes, will the disciples go to Galilee? Will they follow Jesus? Now, the question you might think is, well, why would there be any question? I mean, we know the end of the story, but pretend you don't know the end of the story. And just look at the Gospel of Mark and look what has transpired in the last few days since Jesus was taken into custody. And what's the track record of the disciples? What is the track record of the disciples? What happened in the Garden of Gethsemane that night? They abandoned him. What happened in the courtroom of the high priest with Peter? He denied the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, it's not a slam dunk that the disciples are going to follow Jesus to Galilee and pick up and continue to follow him after the resurrection. Their track record indicates otherwise. They abandoned him. They were faithless. What caused or what overcame the disciples' loyalty and love for Jesus? What was it? Why did they abandon him? Why did they leave him all alone? Their fear. We can understand that, can we not? Their fear of being associated with him. Their fear of being arrested with him. Their fear of being crucified because they're associated with him. Their fear of what would happen to their families. We can understand that type of deep, soul-chilling fear that caused the disciples to abandon Jesus and to now leave open the question whether or not they will go to Galilee. It's not a slam dunk. Their track record, in fact, argues against them going to Galilee and continuing to follow Jesus. Now, we might think, but once they hear about the resurrection, I mean, that changes everything, right? Jesus is resurrected. He's overcome death. He's overcome sin. He now has the victory after the cross. But let me ask you this. Did the resurrection of Jesus on the ground change everything? Did it lead to a change of mind of the Sanhedrin? When the Sanhedrin heard the reports that the tomb was empty, did they go, oh my goodness, we were wrong. He really is the Messiah. Let's find him and begin to worship him. Is that what Jesus' enemies did? When they heard about the resurrection, what did they do? They concocted a lie, right? And began to spread a lie to explain the empty tomb. How about Pilate? When Pilate heard about the resurrection and the empty tomb, did he go, oh my goodness, he really was the king of the Jews. Let's find him and let's install him as the king of the Jews and let's have all of Rome celebrate this is the son of God, the Messiah, the king of the Jews. Is that what happened on the ground? For the readers, some 25 years later, these Roman citizens who lived in and around Rome, what did they know personally would be the result of following Jesus in their day? Acceptance by the Roman government, celebration of their newfound faith as Christians? No. What does it lead to? Persecution. And so do you see that as Mark ends this gospel immediately, his favorite, one of his favorite terms throughout the entire gospel is he ends it abruptly and he leaves open the question whether or not the disciples are going to follow. It then is a question for his readers now 25 years later who know that to follow Jesus is to suffer. To follow Jesus is to be persecuted. And now it leaves open the same question that's before the disciples in the story. Will their fear deter them from following Jesus? For these Romans who are reading it 25 years later, will their fear deter them from following Jesus? 
And I want to suggest to you that the Holy Spirit intends for us, reading it now in 2016, to ask the same question of ourselves. Will our fear deter us from following Jesus? It's interesting the way the Holy Spirit has orchestrated things today that we have heard from Beth about the brothers and sisters around the world who are being persecuted for their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, he, here in America for the last 200 plus years, we have lived in a country that was founded on Judeo-Christian ethics, that has been protective of our religious rights, but we're living in a time when we're seeing the erosion of those protections and we're beginning to see persecution break out against those who follow the Lord Jesus Christ. But we really have been a very protected people. And see, our tendency is to want to resolve this fear politically by trying to put in place leaders who will continue to protect our religious rights, which is appropriate. I'm not suggesting otherwise. But I'm suggesting that God wants to do a work in each of our hearts where he sets us free from our fear. From our fear of suffering for Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know about you, but I haven't suffered a lot. But I've been in that place when I was in high school where I definitely was in a situation, a compromising situation where I either needed to follow Jesus and be out of step with my peers and I remember that, that moment. I remember my heart racing. I remember my face getting red because I was struggling with fear in my heart whether I was going to follow Jesus or I was going to risk being rejected and ridiculed by my peers. Anybody here relate to that? Anybody here in a work situation where you're being pressured by those in authority above you to do things that are unethical, things that are shady, and you have a decision to make whether you're going to follow the Lord Jesus Christ and do what is right and good in the eyes of God, though it pits you against even the authority in your workplace. Anybody been there before? And face that kind of fear that if I walk in righteousness, it may lead to a reprimand, it may lead to being busted down, it may lead even to the loss of our job. How about in a social setting? Have we faced the fear of following the Lord Jesus in a social setting where everybody else is getting drunk? And there's that pressure for us to fit in, go right along with the crowd. But if we follow Jesus, we're going to stand apart. We're going to be different. We're going to be odd, potentially rejected and ridiculed by those around us. Any of us know that kind of fear? All right, I think we're all to some degree or another, can relate to this on some level. And the question before us is, will our fear deter us from following Jesus? And folks, can you not see what is happening all around us in our culture and in our society? Now with what is taking place with this, in this category of our sexuality is a, is a category through which Satan is particularly pushing and putting pressure on Christianity. Now it's the stakes of, are upped with this transgender bathrooms and that whole controversy now about transgenderism. Do you not see what Satan and what the world are doing? Because are we going to follow Jesus? And please, I've got to say this in such a way where, where the extremes are... are we're not talking about extremes. We're not talking about rejecting and getting people in people's faces, still being people of compassion, but not compromising on the truth. will still put us in a position of being persecuted by our culture at large, being called intolerant, homophobics, haters. You see all that coming down the pike? Will we stand for Jesus, not in a militant, ugly way, but will we stand for Jesus and still be willing to suffer the kind of rejection and ridicule, misrepresentation that will surely be hurled at us 
by the world. Will we follow Jesus to Galilee? Will our fear deter us from following Jesus? That's the question that Mark's gospel forces us to consider. Now, as we were talking about this on Friday morning, it was such a, such a great time together thinking about this passage with my brothers. The disciples did go to Galilee, and do you realize that Jesus then was with his men uh, he actually, after his resurrection, he was 40 days here on the earth. And he spent the bulk of that time with his men in Galilee. And here's what I want to suggest to you. As he spent time with his men, initially, Peter, James, and John, and the rest of the disciples, I don't think would have fully have processed the ramifications of the resurrection. I don't think because Jesus was resurrected, all of a sudden, whoa, they understood everything. I don't believe that. I believe that as they walked with Jesus day in and day out over those 40 days, Jesus was revealing to them the ramifications of his resurrection. He was building on the training that they had received from him over three and a half years. He was preparing them to carry on the revolution that he was leaving in their hands, empowered by the Holy Spirit. But that was 40 days of them processing Jesus' crucifixion. Do you remember how the two disciples that he joined uh, along the road to Emmaus, what did Jesus do during that time he was walking with them? What did he do? He took them clear back to Genesis, and he walked them through the Old Testament Scriptures, showing them how the Old Testament Scriptures pointed to him, pointed to his Messiahship, pointed to his suffering on the cross and the significance of that, pointed to his resurrection, pointed to God's kingdom coming in the person of the Messiah. And I think those were the kinds of things that he was working with and processing with the disciples during that time in Galilee when they went to him so that they would understand the full ramification of not only his crucifixion but his resurrection and what it means to walk in his resurrection power. And then we know 50 days after they were cowering in Jerusalem right on the eve of the crucifixion, when they were cowering in Jerusalem for fear, 50 days later, where's Peter? Where's Peter 50 days later on the day of Pentecost? He's right back in Jerusalem, but is he cowering behind locked doors? No, he's standing up in the, in the temple precinct declaring Jesus Christ to be the Messiah, the risen one, the Son of God, and calling all Israel to put their faith in him right out in front of the Sanhedrin, right in the shadow of Pilate's barracks of his Roman soldiers, 50 days later. He's overcome his fear. He's been set free. How does that happen? Because, see, if Peter can be set free from his fear then who else can be set free from our fear? You and me. We can be set free from that fear that would deter us from following Jesus, the very thing we want to do in our heart of hearts. And so I want us to take us to actually Peter's writing in 1 Peter chapter 4, where here Peter gives us some insight that if we will take this in and embrace this, it will set us free from our fear. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 19, Peter himself writes, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are in insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. 
Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Now, we're going to process this just a little bit this morning, but what I want to say to you is, by reading this passage one time this morning, it will not set you free from your fear. One pass won't cut it. Because what's going to happen as soon as we walk out of here? We're going to forget it. Okay? So let's be clear. If you want to be set free from that fear that deters you from following Jesus, you need to go deeper and you need to do more with this passage and passages like it in the New Testament. First of all, you need to meditate on these verses in order to understand them. Secondly, you need to memorize these verses. <gasps> you said the M word. No. You need to memorize, and you can memorize, this passage so that these truths are ever before your mind. Because it's only when these truths are ever before the, your mind that they can transform your feelings and they can transform your behavior. So we meditate on this passage to understand it. We memorize it to keep it ever before us and for the renewing of our minds. And then we pray this passage for God's grace to live it. We ask the Father to bring to us that which we need that we do not have in and of ourselves. We ask the Father to bring to us that grace we need in order to be set free from this fear. And so Peter tells us, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. So what is he saying to us? What is the Holy Spirit saying to us about suffering for being a, a Christian, follower of Christ? Don't be surprised. In other words, I think about this as, as having being realistic in our expectations being realistic in our expectations. Did the world embrace Jesus? What did the world do to Jesus? Murdered him. Now we live in a world that's under the authority of the prince of the power of the air, the arch enemy of God and of Christ. The one who is influencing the world that is away from God. Why would we as followers of Jesus Christ and here is where we as Americans are particularly challenged because of the blessing of our history. We need to praise God for that history, but we need now to have a realistic expectation that to follow Christ is to be subject to suffering and rejection by this world and persecution by this world. So, first of all, let's set realistic expectation of what our experience is going to be as followers of Jesus Christ. Notice also that he says that this fiery trial, this persecution is to test us. What is it testing? What is it testing? Our faith. Whether we are trusting God through this. Whether we will be obedient to God in and through this trial. He later talks about judgment beginning at the house of God. That's really what he's talking about. And so when we're persecuted, that's a test of our faith of our trust, of our relying and our confidence in God and our obedience that follows. Verse 13, but rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. What he's referring to there is as we suffer as partners with Christ Jesus, it's also in, in the anticipation that we will also participate in his glory that we will rejoice and you know if you have been on a team where you have you've put blood or sweat equity right I mean when you go over to the football game and uh, the Bulldogs win a victory who has the greater joy 
the people in the stands or the players who have gone through the pain. The players. It's the same way as we are, as we are suffering as, as partners with Christ in this life, then the joy and the gladness that will be ours when he comes in his glory will be deep and intense. But this also indicates something about the suffering. How long is the suffering? Is it forever? Or is it temporary? It's temporary. And always as we've looked at the, the, the career of our Lord Jesus, the suffering precedes what? The victory. The cross precedes the crown. And so as we have a realistic expectation and we're not surprised by the suffering that comes at us by a hateful world, we remain faithful to the Lord Jesus in that suffering. It also then contributes to the joy and the gladness that will be ours when he comes in his glory. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of God, of glory and of God rests upon you. I think what he's saying there is, listen, if you suffer as a Christian, that's because the world recognizes that you're a follower of Christ. And that's a good thing. Because if they don't persecute you, it's because you look like them. You're not someone to, you're not someone to bother with because you're in this, swimming in the same dirty water they are. But if you are picked out and you're picked on, you're blessed because there's something distinctive about you. They see that you're a follower of Jesus Christ and that should greatly encourage your heart that they can see the spirit of God and of glory that dwells on you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Agreed? All right. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name of being a Christian, of being associated with Jesus Christ. For it is time for judgment, that is to see within the household of God who will trust God and who will be obedient. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? In other words, I think Peter is saying, what is your option? What is your option when, it, when you come to suffering? Do you want to live in the way that the world and, the, and, and those who are away from God and facing their ultimate judgment, do you want to live that way? Or do you want to live the way of Christ? What's your option? And if we're thinking rightly, the best way to live is the way of Christ, even if it includes suffering. It's a far better way. It's life. The other is not life. It's death. Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. And here's the bottom line. Peter brings us to, if, if suffering is what God allows then we accept that from his hand, knowing that he's in control and knowing that he is with us and he will never leave us or forsake us and we are with him and whatever he allows us to go through, it is part of his good plan, his sovereign plan and he's accomplishing what it is he wants to accomplish in and through our lives and we rest in that while we keep doing what? Good that which is good and righteous in his eyes. Now, we're humbled, aren't we, when we read these pamphlets about our brothers and sisters who are under physical, spiritual, psychological suffering, and they are a model to us of those who keep entrusting themselves to a faithful creator. They trust God. They're trusting him. And they continue to do good, and they are finding life. And they are having impact for Jesus Christ in this world. We really can overcome our fear. God so worked in Peter and in all of the disciples that they overcame their fear and rocked the world, right? Those Roman citizens 25 years later, many of them put their faith in Christ and their fear did not deter them from following Jesus and the church continued to expand and grow until it was all throughout the Roman Empire. You see, we can, by God's power, God's word, God's spirit, be set free from fear to follow Jesus. But the way is what I'm talking about today. It's not by hearing this sermon one time. 
This sermon will not set you free from your fear. Hopefully it'll start you along a path. But here's what we need to do again. What do we need to do with regard to 1 Peter 4, 12 through 19? Meditate on it to understand it. Memorize it to renew our minds and to pray that God would give us the grace to live it. See, that's the road to being set free from our fear to follow Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for our study of the Gospel of Mark. And we see in the very ending of Mark, he has really summed up the Gospel. Because throughout, as Jesus came and presented himself, as he taught your word and people recognized that he did not teach like the other teachers. He taught with authority. When they encountered him, and particularly the scribes and the Pharisees encountered him with the paralytic, and he forgave the man's sin and, and then validated his authority to do so by healing the man to walk again, there they were. They were presented with his deity. And all along the way, when he calmed the sea, when he fed the 5,000, when he fed the 4,000, when he brought Jairus' daughter back to life, when he had such compassion on the blind, when he had authority over the demons, when he cast out legion, and he went home, everyone knowing who he was, a free man, a man in his right mind, a man who declared that Jesus had set him free. In all of these ways, there's all of this evidence. And yet people still struggled to believe, still struggled to follow him, even his own men, when Jesus explained a pathway that didn't fit their idea. When they saw him coming as a glorious king to throw off the yoke of the Romans, but he said, no, I'm going to die on a Roman cross. I'm going to be rejected by the spiritual leaders of Israel. His disciples just couldn't follow him there, just couldn't get there, couldn't understand that. And so we're at the same place as we read this the same question is before us. Will we follow Jesus? Will we embrace who he is? Will we trust him? Will we, will we embrace the cross and recognize that suffering comes before glory, the cross before the crown? Lord Jesus, we're, we're at that same place because we are salt and light. We are your representatives in our homes. And then as we go to work, some of us will go to work this afternoon. We're rep, we, are, we are your representative. We are Jesus in that place. And we face opposition. When we go to our schools, we face opposition. And we face that same kind of fear. And Lord Jesus, I pray that you would do that work of renewing our minds and renewing our character as we take in your word, as we embrace the truths that are here, as we look to you, and we look to the Father and the work of the Spirit in our lives, that we would be those who would represent you compassionately, wisely, graciously, but without fear. You did that work in Peter's life. You did that work in the other disciples' lives. You can do that work in our lives. And for this I pray, in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for being here. I uh, hope that you can come back and join us for the Lord's Supper tonight at 5 o'clock. I'll be here up in front if you'd like to chat. Lord bless you as you go.